All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 96 today, uh, How to Lucid Dream and Tripping the Field with Ian J. Did. This will be part two. We did an episode with him a couple weeks back. Uh, he was a little under the weather, so we decided to have him back on. You can check us out at patreon.com slash Mike and Maurice. We have exclusive content and interviews on there. Uh, and check out our website, Mike and Maurice Mind Escape.com. Also, I have the information for Ian's website and uh, how to buy his book, Tripping the Field, down below. What's going on, Ian? How are you? I'm fantastic. Much better than last time. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You you guys don't know me, so you probably couldn't tell I was ill, but I've, I've talked to people who do know me. They're like, yeah, you looked a bit tired. So uh, <laughs> I, feel, I feel better today. So thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me on again. Yeah, you were maybe a little bit nasally, but yeah, I didn't really notice too well, much. Well, that's... That's common anyway. I've got nonstop congestion all the time. I'm allergic to house dust. You just can't get away from house dust. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, in the wintertime, my nostrils are pretty I, – I have one open at a time, so it goes back and forth. I'm just used to it at this point, you know? I've tried everything too. Doctors have put me on everything. I had one doctor tell me, like, just stay inside. Like, you know, you're allergic to stuff outside, so just stay inside. I'm like, oh, that's, sweet. that's your solution. Yeah, that was real good. That was good. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't keep him. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why don't we start off? Why don't you describe yes. um, how to lucid dream for people that have never, you know, induced it or are aware sure. of it? Should we talk about again just a refresher on exactly what lucid dreaming is? I think yeah. that's always an, it's always a good thing because uh, I I I have these conversations a lot, you know, on the air, online, and whatnot. And one of the when people come into this. Field. They, they hear about lucid dreaming and they're not really sure what it means. They think lucid and they think intense and they say, oh, I had this really intense dream that was super real, yada, yada, yada. And, uh, you know, that's those are awesome. I mean, those that that is that might borderline on on that category of lucid dreaming. But it's when we talk about lucid dreaming proper, ah, we're talking about. You are fully aware that you are dreaming while the dream is taking place. And what I'm really saying is that, and I'm going to get to the, we're gonna, hopefully we're going to get to the nitty gritty, since this is kind of part two, we've talked about some of the basics. Really what we're talking about is that you are not buying the narrative that your dream is selling you. So I want people to consider that idea when they consider lucid dreaming there is a narrative to your dream. There is a storyline that's going on and you are completely, you become completely detached from that narrative. And for the the best way to describe what happens after that is that you wake up, but not physically. You, your body is still asleep, but there is a, your consciousness detaches from the narrative. You become fully aware as aware as we are sitting here right now, you know, having this show. You are aware of what's going on. And when this would happen to me, I I would even kind of know what time of the day it was. I would know kind of what position my body was sleeping in, everything. I was fully awake, but the the dream was still – it's like you're in <laughs> – it's almost like virtual reality. If you guys have toyed around with some of the high-end virtual reality, uh, you know, some of the new Oculus technology yeah, and whatnot, yeah. it it's like that times 10 is all I can tell you because you are fully submerged now in this world, but now you're kind of you're not you're not at the you're not at the disposal of this storyline anymore. Okay, you're not trapped in it. You're not you're free, so to speak. And so that's what we talk about. That's what I'm talking about. When I say lucid dreaming, that's what we're trying to get you to. We're trying to get people to that state of becoming fully aware and detached from their dream narrative. And when we talk about how you do that, now what I've explained before is that I was, I was perhaps, I'm maybe one of those lucky people but it's not always, it's not really luck. We're going to talk about this. It, this came to me spontaneously. I, around the age, I was probably about 19 years old or so. It just started happening at night where I would, I would start, I would go into a normal dream state like anything else, but then something would click and I would just realize, oh, 
none of this is real. This I, I, I recognize the dream for what it was. And getting there is, it, it might be easy for some people. It might take years for others, depending on where you're starting from. And when I say where you're starting from, I would say that a lot of this has to do with what is your attachment to to narrative? And when I say that, I mean that on a lot of levels. We are surrounded by storylines all the time in our lives. Uh, we watch movies, right? We read books. But the biggest one is that we have a story going on in our heads about our lives. We are constantly talking to ourselves in our heads. Some people call it the internal dialogue. So I always go back to that. I always go back to what is your relationship with your own narrative? And when you really start examining that, that inner story that you keep going, that you have kind of running in your head, that the more you start examining that, the more you start investigating that, who you are, inside that narrative that's when wonderful things start to happen and i'd say that lucid dreaming is just one side effect that's that's the one that i talk about but ultimately it's it gets it's bigger than that because when you are able to detach from narrative you are you are freeing yourself you're freeing your consciousness in ways that are in ways that I thought were impossible and we'll get into that as well of just what lucid dreaming can lead to what detaching from this narrative seems to mean for us as humans. I mean, it, it, I would say that it almost redefines in many ways. It redefines who we are, what exactly we are as conscious beings in this world. So it's, I, I that's the reason I speak about it. It's the reason I write about it because the, the importance of this topic, I don't think can be exaggerated. It's really that, it's that intense. So how do you do it? How, how, like, I, like I said, it came to me automatically. It just, I just started realizing this was nonsense. But one, there's a lot of things we can do. One of the things that I really, I really love are reality checks. I love, I love reality checks throughout the day. I think that's a great thing place to start if you ha if you have no experience with this and by a reality check i mean just that you should stop at several times throughout the day some people set a timer even i i don't i've never gone that far but if you really want to get your head into this into this field start checking throughout the day as many times and the best way to do that as i've mentioned before i think on the last time is the easiest thing to do is to lift your hand in front of your face. And uh, have I mentioned that on the last show? Did we talk yeah. about the, yeah. it's, and it's, it's so, it's such an elegant, simple thing. And that's not my idea. I did not coin, I did not come up with this. This was from a book that was talked about shamans from ancient Mexico that I, that I picked up long, long time ago. And it was such an elegant, simple thing uh, to simply lift your hand in front of your face and you stare at it, you stare at it. And there seems to be a universal truth that if you keep doing this long enough, the idea is that eventually you will think to do this in your dream. All right. You'll think to do this. And if you can do the simple thing, just lift your hand in front of your face and stare at it. What will happen is whenever you stare at anything in your dream state long enough, it will only take a few moments at first, especially if you're new to this within a few moments your hand will shape shift. It will change colors. Uh, it will become invisible. Sometimes I've looked at my hand and there I've got 10 fingers or it, the, my skin just spirals off into nothing. And uh, that can be a bit jarring. I mean, let's, that's, that's a strange thing to suddenly, you know, look at your hand and have something crazy happen. But what that does is that that sends a deep, deep signal to the deepest part of our conscious selves. And it tells us that, oh, that's it. Now, you know, you know, for a fact, I'm dreaming right now. And all of the narrative immediately shuts down. You immediately go, oh, I don't have to follow the storyline that I've been, you know, whatever your dream is about. Think about the craziest last dream you had. Immediately that can stop. And now once that stops, now you're in control. 
uh, now you can kind of take the helm, so to speak. And that's when things get real interesting. And that's what started for me about now it's been it's been almost 30 years uh now since this the, the first time that i woke up in a dream uh and uh i've for the for the next 10 years after or so somewhere around 10 years i was lucid dreaming almost every night after that because your mind get tuned gets tuned to it so one of the things you can do to get your mind tuned to it is doing almost <laughs> one of the things is like i said besides the reality checks is uh Listening to shows like this, oddly enough, you know, some people are like, you know, I've watched your show. I want to, you know, I want to get involved in it. I said, you're getting involved in it. You're listening to these ideas. You are, you obviously are watching shows like this. You're watching, you know, they're listening to guys like you. They're fascinated with the paranormal. I love people who are fascinated with paranormal stuff that, sh that tells me that they, they have, per they have possibly not bought the, the narrative that they've been sold about their world. Right. I mean, isn't that what the fascination with the paranormal is really about? The idea of ghosts or aliens or any kind of supernatural possibility. We some of us are drawn more deeply to that idea that there's something more than what, you know, the, the, the world that I've been sold, the storyline that I've been sold by my parents, my teachers, our scientists, our philosophers, our religious leaders, whatever. I mean, who it is, whoever it is that's had the most influence on you. Yeah, I think it's that basic human instinct that we have where you're right. We we know there's something more to all this, but we don't know what it is and we don't right. love the explanation that, you know, materialists or academics give us on what's happening during sleep or why some people believe in ghosts and why there's weird things in the air over California and the East coast <laughs> and yeah. why that can't be explained. Um, yeah. so, but so your initial point was there's a difference between lucid dreaming and having, I would call what you were trying to describe as like a vivid dream. Right. Exactly. So, so what most people think is just an intricate dream that they remember would most likely just be called a vivid dream. Just a vivid dream. You've had a very vivid, intense dream, and I've had hundreds of those as well. Those are those are great. I would not categorize them as lucid unless you were aware that you were dreaming. That's that's really the whole crux of the matter. If you were aware that you were dreaming fully, and now this is where things get a little bit complicated because there's levels to lucidity, all right? I would say there's levels until you have done that trick where you have stared at your hand. There are levels. And one of those levels is if you've ever had a dream where you have this idea in the back of your head while, while this dream is taking place, like, you know, this isn't real. This isn't really happening. Have you ever had that sort of sense, but yet you're still following the rules of the dream? Let's suppose you're being chased by monsters or something like that down the street. I've had a hundred dreams where there's some part of me in the background that goes, I know this isn't real. I know these things can't really hurt me, but I haven't fully woken up. I haven't fully stopped and gone, wait, none of this is real. Why am I even running? These, What are these things even? And then you can stop and literally turn around and face whatever is chasing you. And that's, again, that's when things get real interesting when you start uh, facing some of these things that are in your dream. Because when you become lucid, the dream doesn't necessarily stop. The action doesn't necessarily stop. Now, sometimes they've it's stopped for me where I've kind of like found myself in a, I don't know, sort of a, a blank zone. Yes, you've, you've seen The Matrix. Everyone's seen The Matrix, right? Yeah, I haven't seen right? it in a long time, but we've okay. definitely seen it. But you can, but if you can remember the parts where, when they go into these these loading programs before anything is loaded, they're sort of in this white blank space, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've had that, that sort of stuff too, where I become lucid and everything just sort of stops, and you find yourself kind of in a, and that's what it feels like. I feel like I'm in that matrix sort of thing, which there's I, I refer to the matrix all the time because there's so many connections to lucidity. It, it's it's ridiculous. Great but, movie. Great it ideas. Is a, great ideas. Mind blowing. I, I, we'll see what they do with part four. But uh, yeah, there's. No, there's no. Yeah, I know. They, I know. <laughs> they're, they are. They're doing a part four. I. That's what oh, they're saying. Man. But, uh, oh yeah, yeah. They're, you bring they're up an interesting up. point, though. So yeah, yeah. I've had that many happen many times where I'm in a dream. I tell myself this 
what is this? This isn't really happening, but yet I still continue yeah. to participate in it. Exactly. Uh, that's the, th- for that's whatever the reason, I don't, I don't, do you think it's an urge to want to stay asleep? Cause there's like a comfort there that's happening within the moment. Or do you think that uh-huh. I, I know modern science thinks that dreams, whatever kind of dream it is, is your brain trying to problem solve. Yep. Well, well that's, I'd, I'd like to hear his thoughts of that. What he actually thinks dreams are, but maybe we can get to that at the very end. Sure. Sure. We'll talk about that. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I would probably generally agree with most scientists views of what, Typical, what typical dreams are. Yeah, you're dealing with your subconscious. You're working problems out. But we'll, we'll, we can talk about that. Sure, please continue. Uh, so, no, I was just saying, you know, we participate knowing or yes. when you are in that realm, you're participating knowing that you're asleep and dreaming. And uh, I meditate and stuff, like I mentioned the last time we talked about this. And can I, I think- ask you? Can I, sorry to interrupt, but can I ask you about your meditation practice at some point before we, you know, before the end of this, let's, let's go into a meditation practice. Cause there are certain meditations that will, that I'd say would be more beneficial to getting yourself lucid than others. But let's, let's, let's talk about that. So I have our, med- my meditation style all posted out on our website. They can check it okay. out under recommendations, but I'll just go through it really quick. So it's a mixture of like what our, how our grandfather was like a visionary inventor and he wrote his, the way that he did it down. So I took some of that mixed with some of my own mixed with what I thought worked. Okay. Um, So what I do is I usually do it in the morning. I don't eat breakfast. I usually don't eat breakfast anyways, but you get that feeling in your stomach that you're like kind of hungry. So you've got, you're in like fasting mode a little bit. Uh, I either take a shower or just clean up a little bit. And then I don't sit in like, you know, the the cross-legged position or anything like that. I actually lay back down on my bed, but I don't get in bed. I just lay on top of the bed. Whatever works. Yeah. And I close my eyes lightly, just barely closing over my eyelids. And I focus on that and keep it barely, uh, barely closed. And I focus on keeping it there, which is actually hard to do if you're not used to it. I think that's why... A lot of people fail at meditation that say they can't do it or they don't like it because it does take some sort of focus and some sort of practice. It's not you just don't sit down and start meditating like, oh, I got it. So um, and then from there, I just throw on some uh, four twenty eight hertz, some sort of frequency, just mellow, chill. And I just start breathing and I focus on my breath. And then at some point I start to see these like lights start to swirl over my yeah. vision. I don't know what that is, but I, I see that too. And it, it trips me out. I still don't know what that is. Some people call it hypnogagia or I'm not really sure what the, but it's a, a, specific, a specific swirling sort of a thing that I see all the time. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I, f- I focus on that and I try and follow that. And then it eventually like leads to places. And then once you start getting like 30, 40 minutes in, if you, if you last that long, uh, you start to see weird stuff. I've gone to what I think are other places. I've seen weird sure. alien worlds. And I don't mean like alien, alien. I just mean like alien is in foreign to what I know. You it every day. Yeah. Right. And uh, just I've seen like weird disembodied heads and things I've never seen before. Um, so, okay. yeah. And that that's kind of what my meditation's like. What's what's going on in your thinking while this is happening? I mean, how how good are you at shutting off your own, you know, thinking about that what you've got to do for the rest of the yeah, day, or thinking I, about I that I don't do that at all. Somehow, I'm I'm able to just well, block that out completely. Are you that now? That's rare. That is that's amazing that you. So are I'm able I'm just to focusing on like I mentioned, like the lights, the just being right. there, there, breathing. You know, I'm I'm not really focusing on oh i got to do this i do that so if i'm laying in bed before i fall asleep sometimes i'll do what you're talking about but when i meditate it's like i'm going in with a purpose and i'm going to do it and i'm not going to let anything you know i put my phone on airplane mode and stuff like that so so what is your focus i mean do you have a specific focus be you know that you could actually put into words at all or i would just say my my focus is to tap into whatever that energy is that we were just talking about or whatever that whatever whatever's happening i want to know more about that so okay um Uh, but i don't push for you know what i'm saying it's not like a forceful i gotta find this thing and then i gotta stick with it it's not like that at all it's just 
it comes on after a certain amount of time and then you just start paying attention to it and then you get hypnotized by it a little bit and then yeah you know what what you're doing sounds sounds great uh, i have, i have no real recommendations beyond that because it sounds like what you are the key thing that i was that i wanted to get at was what, whether or not you're able to shut off that narrative that i keep coming back to are you able to detach from that and you're telling me or it sounds like you're able to stop doing that for most people when they sit down to meditate you know you they'll find only then often often only then do people realize just how noisy their head is and some people will do anything to block out that noise i mean so much of our our electronics and our and our media you know, it is, we are using it to get away from that internal noise. But, but until you meditate and you sit down and you try to do that, unfortunately, so many people are not even aware of just how little control they have over their internal thinking. Immediately they'll start going, oh yeah, I've got to, I've got to go to work tomorrow and I've got to pay that bill. And there's that financial problem. And, oh, and then there's that relationship thing that I'm dealing with. And it just never stops. You know, there was a, a guru who I read who said most people who sit in meditation uh, for 10 minutes, by the end of the 10 minutes, they're managing some grocery store in their head and they're going through some fictional idea of some conversation. You know, it's like your brain just trails off. So, so it sounds like that's what you're, what you are doing is, is what I would love for everyone to start engaging in. And Sometimes I'm say, even so comfortable that I fall asleep afterwards, for a little, or yeah, I want, or I want sure. to, you know. It's, I, I do the same thing, and I, in fact, I'm, I often meditate before bed so that if I start falling asleep, well, if I'm just going to go to sleep, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a good so tactic. it's it's easier for me instead of falling asleep in the middle of the day or or something like that. But but like I said, the main thing is that I would say that you are you're detaching from your internal thinking we like i said we it's funny that we when you think of crazy people in this culture we think of people who are talking to themselves but the reality is is that we're all talking to ourselves all the time we're thinking to ourselves we are you know and i'm saying become aware of that internal thinking and be and when you become aware of it you're going to realize how much of it is garbage and it's nothing that we need to be it's just empty rambling i'm not saying that we don't need to think sometimes we absolutely do there is a we're addicted to thinking is what it is which you asked a question which i think is the is one of the most is the greatest question is why are we addicted to these storylines why are you know what is it that draws us to you know you said keeping this dream story going or why do we want to keep you know why are we attached to this and i would say that we have an addiction to narrative we have an addiction to storyline and all i can say is that that's probably been an affliction for us humans since we've gained the ability to speak once we once there was spoken language that all of a sudden we started taking every everything in our world turning it into a symbol and we shoved that symbol into our head. And then our brain started working off of those symbols. I would say before there was speech, and they say that was probably somewhere, the estimation is somewhere around 100,000 years ago. Some, you know, that's, that's uh, estimations that they, that they think are probably fairly accurate. Around 100,000 years ago, we became capable of speech. We had, we had a, a spoken language and we started using it. So somewhere around there, yes, that, that changed everything that I'd say that that's one of the, one of the things that put us at the top of the food chain as, as a species on this planet, our speech is, is the most incredible power ever. But there is also, there's, there was a, you know, a sort of a give and take, I, I guess you could say it was, it was a catch 22 that now we're thinking to ourselves all the time and we are, we're addicted to it. And I'd say that the, one of the reasons we're addicted to storyline. And when I say storyline, I mean that not just on the things that are going on in your own head, but we're addicted to storylines on our televisions. We're addicted to storylines in books. We're addicted to – it's all narrative. It's all a storyline, right? On some level, mm-hmm. we're addicted to it. I mean most people who are staring at their phones obsessively all day, what they're really addicted to is – Feed me another story. Feed me another little, even if it's just a a two second blip blip of a of a little quick video or something. 
it's a tiny little storyline you get addicted to. And I'd say the reason we're addicted to it is because we have a thing about order. Storylines in in general, what a storyline is, is taking our world, taking our the chaos of all of the of all of the stimuli, all of the information that we're subjected to all day long, all in our entire lives. And we're streaming it into this nice little, well, this happened and then this happened and this happened. All right. There's something about our brains. Our brains love order. Our brains are built on order. And what's funny is that, of course, the more neuro, you know, uh, neurologists have studied how the brain works, they're finding more and more that our brain works very much like a movie editing system, that our brain is, you know, we have this idea that we're just open and taking in everything that's happening around us, right? But the reality is, is that we're not. Our brain is taking in billions of pieces of information and and it edits it. It it says, well, I'm I'm not gonna I'm gonna ignore this. I'm gonna focus on this. I'm gonna ignore this. And then it tries to stream it into a storyline. It's like we are we're now built for narrative. And again, even when you want to memorize something, when you you know they say this that you know rote memorization uh, of facts, for example, is never going to be as powerful as as you you being if I tell you a story, you're going to be able to remember that story as opposed to if I just gave you ten facts, random facts that happened in in that storyline. You know, without the, without the narrative, your brain would go, oh yeah, well, you know, X, Y, and Z. But once it's in a storyline, our brain goes, oh yeah, I can connect it. I can make a I can turn that into a a linear thing, and it seems that it seems like my world is in order. So now I'm now 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 I'm the guy telling you. But you can break away from that. You can step away from that. It's okay. You know, it's scary, I would say. Many people who start really stepping into meditation or lucid dreaming or anything that takes them out of their narrative, that can be very frightening at first. Uh, that has That can happen through psychedelics. That can happen through something just mind-blowing. Or it can happen through the paranormal. It can happen by, you know, people who have seen UFOs, for example, example or aliens or ghosts or anything like that. Whatever the reality of that situation is, if they've believed it, if they've, if, if it was intense and intense of an experience enough for them to go, well, this changes everything. Now I, it's like, now I have to face the idea that my idea, my storyline that I have about how the world works is not accurate. And that scares the hell out of some people, you know, that's, that's very frightening. So these topics are what, when we talk about how to get into these things, it's almost like you have to ask yourself, are you a person who's really willing to drop your own narrative? Are you willing to really look beyond your own storyline and, and go, all right, what's, what's really going on? And I'm not saying become a conspiracy theorist. I'm not saying, because you know, some people believe, some people go, they jump from one thing to another. And, and I deal with the, the spiritual community all day long, for example, who are, a lot of them are going, oh, well, now I've, I'm getting into these, this meditation and lucid dreaming or astral projection. And then they pick up a whole brand new set of dogma. They, 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 they've read a few books and it becomes a brand new storyline for them. And mm -hmm. what I'm constantly trying to do is I don't care what, I don't care if you're a Buddhist. I don't care if you call yourself a, a Wiccan or a new ager or a Christian or whatever philosophy and, or an atheist I don't care where you're coming from. My what I keep on pointing the finger back to is what is the storyline that you're addicted to? What is the story that you are attached to? And are you willing to drop it? That makes a lot of sense. You Good brought point. up an, yeah. you brought up an interesting point though that I want to talk about. Yeah. And I've been looking a lot into this myself. I've been studying a lot of ancient philosophy and where language and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. When you look at it you could almost say magic is real in the sense that when we created language, when we created writing, we created a whole world. We created a we universe. Did. We did. Um, yes. So, and you look at even the ancient Egyptians who, you know, one of their gods was Thoth, who was known as the scribe God. You know, when you start okay. analyzing that kind of stuff, you look into, okay, well, the second they started writing down hieroglyphics, stuff became real. It became yes. part of reality. And we all partake in this 
big whatever you want to call it this this big game or big charade where we all identify with certain words we're taught certain words we're taught language we're taught terms and then we use them in the way that we were taught that of what they mean they're assigned certain values or correlated with certain things so really we are living breathing magic in the sense that we're using this this communication and this way to exchange ideas that's building this entire universe that we know now absolutely Yes. Now, by doing that, I think that's kind of where consciousness began. And I'm not saying things aren't conscious that aren't intelligent like us or have certain, obviously a dog's conscious, a cat's conscious, anybody that's had an animal can agree, but they're not conscious to the level of that we know of where they're pondering their existence or what happens right. after they die, or there's just no way to even figure that out anyways, that we have technology for even if that were to happen um right so what do you think about that though do you think that that there is some validity to that line of thinking because like you said we all have some connection to this metaphysical even people that aren't that are like let's say a, a hardcore uh materialist or a dogmatic academic or whoever you want to say even those people have uh, predilections to certain weird, quirky things as well. They might not admit to it, but absolutely, uh, yeah. In in some sense, you know, whether like you said, ghosts or aliens, or and I think even now with the whole UFO thing that's been going on and all the sightings and the the those videos, the Tic Tac and the Go yeah. Fast and all those videos that came, the gimbal video, all those videos that came out, we're starting to see more of the military aspect of it come out where the military is talking about it there. They changed the Naval guidelines on UFO sightings where you shouldn't be afraid to discuss these things. If you see these things and you're an air force pilot or a Naval pilot or whatever, wh- why do you think that is? Do you think it is this connection to we created this world or do you think that it's something completely different and we're all just, it's just a big jumble and there is no real answer or anything. So, in my view, I would say that when when we're when we're saying that our our internal dialogue, our storyline that we that we all carry, and again, as I said, everybody is connected to a slightly different story. An atheist is connected to his story, just like a Christian is connected to his story. Uh, but uh, w- what I'm saying, what I would say, is that. It's not that our our ability for language necessarily created it. You could say it created a new world. What I would say is that everything in the universe was perhaps before our our connection to narrative. Before this happened, everything was available to us at face value. What we did, what we do with narrative, that the magic of I would say the magic is that we are able to then select. It, it's it's an editing, if you will, of taking very specific parts of that and making it a linear, taking the chaos and making it linear for us. That that is the magic. But what I would say is that outside of that narrative, below that narrative, you can get outside of our storylines that we're connected to. We have, we naturally, our consciousness, clearly what I have learned firsthand, our consciousness has a natural uh, ability to do incredible things. We are a boundless consciousness. And one of the things that these practices have taught me is that once I have learned how to disconnect from my storyline, once I, the more and more I, 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 the deeper I got into detaching from it what i started realizing is that magic is almost like our base selves it is our natural ground state i would say that things like astral projection lucid dreaming you know on a a lot of things like that i would say that those are things that you almost have to break away from the storyline to experience but it's not it's the the magic is that we is that we aren't awake in our dreams all the time. The magic is that we're not astrally projecting all the time. If that, if, if you're following me, yeah. 
I'm kind of putting a different twist on this is that a lot of the things that we generally refer to as paranormal or magic, it's I would say it is our natural state. So, you know, what what trips people out a lot is that uh, after I have these conversations, I will still come back and refer to myself as an atheist with an asterisk at the end of that is is the way I always say. Because and they're like, "Well, how can you be an atheist?" Because because what I would say is that below all of these things that we call magic, I would say these these are our consciousness is amazing what it can already do. We are putting a leash on ourselves on some level. You know, that that narrative, that storyline, we get our order from chaos, but it's also a cage. It's also a sort of a leash that, you know, we have evidence now that shows that if you totally don't believe something is possible, even if it's right in front of you, you might not see it. And I don't know if that's how, how far we can take that idea, but, you know, there's the old, I, there's this old story and I don't know, you know, I don't, it's a, I'm not sure how much validity there is to it, but the idea of that when the Indians, the the native, the native Americans in this country first saw the, the ships, you know, from Europe coming over, they had never seen a ship of this size before. And there's this story that the the natives on the shorelines could not see the ships at first. Have you ever heard this idea? The idea that yeah, they I'm trying to think even, where did I see? I, I have they, seen something. I'm not. I'm not sure, and I don't know if the story is real. But I like the idea because I think it. Even if that specific story isn't true, it's the idea that it took a shaman to come out. That's the rest of the story. The shaman of the village had to come out, and you know, because the people were like, "There's something out there. We can't quite put." We can't make sense of it. We're not seeing it properly because, again, they don't they didn't have a storyline around a ship. And so they had no context for it. So what they see and what we would see would be two totally different things, you know, and I believe that that is absolutely true, that your narrative also traps you and it and it and your brain will edit things out, perhaps that that you're just not capable of seeing. I mean, my idea is that I have an, I have a feeling that there's more people out there who have seen paranormal things than, than they're even willing to admit. Do you know right, what I'm saying? Right. Like people who have seen UFOs, people who have seen ghosts, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever those things are, you almost, you may even have to be a type of person who is willing to say, maybe, Maybe my story isn't right. Maybe aliens do exist. Maybe ghosts do exist. You know, uh, you have to be willing to do that to see it. Yeah, I think um, those are some interesting points. And I have heard stuff along the lines of what you were describing. But I think more of the ones I've heard have to do with like when colors, because there are some colors that we've developed or that people have produced through maybe natural things like berries and stuff i think was purple was maybe one of them back in there i'm trying to think what color it was but until you it's like programmed into your consciousness you can't see it for some reason or something along yeah. those lines yeah um, but i want to touch back on to so your point about uh, the question that i was asking about building language and building consciousness and i think though is aren't we trending towards something in, in the sense that we started off you're right we came up with language what a hundred thousand years ago a way to communicate maybe they're clicks or noises or right basic primal sounds and then it's yes. evolved to now where we're having this discussion through this computer <laughs> but but don't you think that this narrative is all coming it the, what's happening is in my personal opinion is we're constantly building this thing up, 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 up. So we are becoming more of one mind in the sense that the more we all kind of get on the same page, the more we become closer to what you would maybe see in like Hindu texts or something like that, where we are this one consciousness. And even with the internet and technology, we are even more connected than we ever have been. So I see this thing happening. Some people call it singularity with AI and technology, but there could be the singularity with human consciousness as well in terms of we're all trending towards this one thing for whatever reason or another. I, I, what do you think about that? Uh, first and foremost, I would say that as far as consciousness goes, there is already a singularity. It's not something to be reached. So that is something that I that I have gained much wisdom from, that if uh, we have to stop looking at 
singularities and the idea of enlightenment from the conscious level as something that you need to achieve. So if if you're following me with this idea of stripping away narrative, it is it's not about, you know, I'm going to I'm going to talk like Yoda for a second. You know, mm-hmm. you have to unlearn what you've been taught. It's about unlearning that because underneath all your storylines, we're already connected. You're already enlightened. There is nothing to achieve. There is no mountain to climb. There is no special uh, ceremony <laughs> to, to go through. However, it's all about realizing it, right? It's all about being aware of it. But what you're talking about on the, on the worldwide scale in with our physical reality, where we are seeing that all of these things do seem to be coming together and, and that we've got these incredible technologies exploding almost on a daily level. Yeah, that's what and I'm I, talking that, about in the sense yeah. that, because I kind of agree with you, maybe on the pure conscious level, there is this one state or this one non-duality or whatever you want to call it. Sure. But then in our waking state or our normal day-to-day consciousness and reality, there is separation. Yeah. You can't deny it. it we exactly. Might, deep down, we might be part of the same thing, but in this game or whatever's going on, we are all participating as separate entities. So that's that's what I meant by that. Sorry, I, I just wanted yes. to clarify that. Absolutely. And, I, yeah, I'm, and that's – so I think that that is interesting. It almost seems like that – Perhaps there is a a nature to this planet or a nature to the universe that that eventually the, our physical realities will start mimicking the truth of our consciousness. And if the truth of our consciousness is already that we are already connected in one, it's almost like that our physical our physical world it's always going to be a step behind. It's like this slowly it's going to start merging into the you know, on the physical level as well, that maybe in, in the future we will all be hooked up to the matrix on some level. I mean, we're, it, it's not that crazy anymore. Even when the matrix came out, you know, people could at least follow it. We could follow the logic, but now I think that's been 20 years ago now, something, something like that. Now the, the advances that we have made with combining what's going on uh, with our physical bodies and our minds, the, how they're able to read read brain waves with our electronic devices and transfer that into an electronic code, it, it doesn't sound all that crazy anymore that we could be absolutely moving towards a singularity on this planet. Uh, and, you know, yeah, some people say, what does that have to do with artificial intelligence? I, I I don't I don't have those I don't have those answers I don't know what what that will look like. Uh, it's I think an we're interesting... a long way. I think we're a long. I think we're further away than we think we are. But I do think if we do continue down the road, it is inevitable that we will have some super advanced AIs. I'm still yeah. not convinced that we can make AI conscious because we don't even know what consciousness is based on our. That's own. the that is the problem, isn't it? Like, well, how do you you know what is it that makes something conscious? And you know, in my philosophy, I would say that consciousness just is. It's not something you can create. It's not something that you can deassemble or reassemble or put together or manufacture. It is something that it. I would say that it is our base state. So, I I part of me feels, and again, I. I'm kind of talking out of my ass here a little bit because I don't I don't know. I'm I'm theorizing about technology and so, you know, I'm I'm making stuff up here, but perhaps perhaps the moment you have a system, a computerized system that is able to very well replicate some idea of free will and choice in the human mind if you're if it's able to somehow be independent on some level I, I don't know what that looks like electronically or from a computer standpoint I, I would almost say that consciousness is already there so you ever watch the old star treks you know i used to watch the old star trek where they always yeah. always have this conversation about uh the android data is is data conscious you know uh-huh. those kind of you know or and they and we've had this in in recent uh shows as well uh, ex machina if you've seen the movie ex beautiful machina where he, film. he yeah. had beautiful film wonderful and i would say from my philosophy that android is absolutely should be afforded all of the same rights that we have because that 
we can't make a distinction between a, a, a human anymore. So right. to say where to say where consciousness is, I would say that that's a dangerous road to go down. To to assume first of all that we know what consciousness is, and then to say, well, because of that, I'm also going to say that this android isn't conscious. Well, maybe we're looking at that in the wrong way. Maybe consciousness is just a base. Field. Maybe it is a quantum field, uh, you know, along the lines of the electromagnetic fields or, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's just another field in our in our cosmos. We don't know that. We at least not yet, at least. Uh, but so I, w- I, I will say, though, that, I think, though, even if something passes the Turing test, which is the right. test that exactly. they, they give these AIs, if they can it, passing would be you cannot distinguish normal human being from this machine. Exactly. And, if that comes to that point, I don't necessarily still think that that uh, AI or that whatever it is is even conscious or has consciousness. It's just that it's been programmed to replicate what exactly. we think consciousness is. And, and I would say that our, you could almost say the same thing about our own brains, though, is the problem with that. I would say that on some level, another race could come and look at the way our brains deal with information, the way our synapses deal with information and go, you know, are these things really conscious? I mean, they replicate. They have all these ideas and they're able to communicate and whatnot. But are they conscious? I, I'm just saying that all I could say from my standpoint is that if something can pass the Turing test – I, I would I would absolutely go, I'm staying out of it at this point. <laughs> I think that we have to just go, we have to assume and err on the safest side and go, that thing is self-aware somehow. That thing is aware. And so that's all I would say because sure. I don't feel I don't feel we're ever gonna have a code in, in our on our computers that goes, oh now we've solved that consciousness code. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't I don't see that that's something that's that's going to happen. We're going to be able to replicate the way the brain works, but that's that's kind of like the brain in many ways. I see it as a radio. Well, just because you understand all the, you can look at all the parts of a radio when you open it up, but that doesn't mean all that the the music is is really originating from that radio. Right. You know, it's like that's it's it gets complicated. I mean, that's true, that though. I mean, even on a scientific level, because we know we're taking everything's the vibration of free, certain frequencies of particles. Right. So in that sense, we are with our senses taking in all of this data and we're processing right. it. And th- this we're it's what reality is. Right. So if we, if we were, if our bodies were the computer and then, you know, our surroundings are the ones and zeros, we're taking in all those ones and zeros <clears throat> and processing this information. Um, but I will say that, I think about that a lot. The point that you're making is how do we know that we aren't just coming up with stuff or when we think about consciousness, how do we know that consciousness is this special thing or it is this separate thing that is separates us from the pack? I would say, look at the way that we're able to change our surroundings, the way that we're able to change our environment and, and influence Uh, other things and people and manipulate things and so i think that that makes us different now that still doesn't answer that question and i do think about it a lot does are we are we special or is are we tricking ourselves into believing that we're special and we really (laughs) are just these biological entities that are maybe more superior but not as superior as we think we are so i do think about that a, a lot and i also think about if that's the case, and I think about because in terms of how information's just are uh, uh, spread out and shared and everything, we do a lot of copying. You see it. Yes. And, and art should be original as much as original as possible. But even great artists have their influences. Great musicians have their. Yeah, you got to be inspired by something. You yeah, know? you know, it's 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 it comes from somewhere. So I think Always. that so are we just this big ball of momentum that we've had all these influences and with all these ideas and they're all culminating into this perfect moment that we're here today, or is it something that's different? And I I think our purpose as human beings or whatever is to create things, whether it's art, other people, um, society, 
things for society, things like along those along those lines. But again, I do look at then I look at like Hollywood and it's like you can't write your own new movie. You got to come up with you got to take a comic book episode or yep. or a comic book uh, and turn it into a movie or you got to remake a classic or whatever the case may be. It seems like there's less and less originality. And even with music, it seems like there's less. There's like these golden eras of these certain things and then there's just bad copies and that's uh, in many ways that you could argue that that's all that the human mind can ever do it can only ever just take in the information that's been that it's been subjected to and rearrange it in a different way i mean as you know i'm a writer i'm an, i'm also an artist but yeah, also there's some great art i've seen some of your stuff but I'd also say that there's nothing that I even could create that is just a hundred percent, you know, <laughs> original. I I don't even know how what that would even mean. It doesn't even make sense, honestly. My book, I would say that I did the best that I could to to write a book that is as original as I possibly could. But but still, my book still had to follow the basic function of a storyline. It still follows the hero's journey format. Now I added I added the craziest, you know, strangest adventure within that format, but I still had to start with a format that we all agree on that is a story. You know, we have to kind of, you know, art, yeah, like you're saying, that it's a it's a tough thing. So I do that and if and I can see that, you know, we have programs on some level that are able to do that. I mean, some of the ideas behind artificial intelligence is is just that. If it's able to you know, re manipulate information on some level. It's it's able to rearrange information in new ways. Man, what that that that's basically what our brains do. But yet, you talk about these other things, like the idea of well, then what is inspiration? What is what is will? What is drive? You know, why do, why am I even driven to talk about these things? That those are great questions. I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe I, but maybe I will also, never know. That's the thing, you know, but I could also say that perhaps in a way I'm programmed to, I mean, it is, if I found out on some level, some down the road that, that I, that I was an Android, you know, that question from ex machina, the guy starts wondering, mm -hmm. wait, am I an Android? I, I wouldn't feel upset by that. That wouldn't, I wouldn't be feel diminished by that because you know, whatever it is, I'm hooked into consciousness. So whether whether I'm a human or I'm a I'm a monkey or an alien or I'm an android, uh, I know that I'm I know that I'm conscious. So it, the rest feel, to me doesn't doesn't make a difference. So my interest is always just trying to find ways so people can draw back and and experience their own consciousness, become more aware, become more conscious, and that again we comes back to it comes back to our narrative that we are. We are products of our narrative, and you can say that also means that we're products of our culture, we're products of our upbringing, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that brings up questions about other cultures. When we talk about the Egyptians, you brought up the Egyptians for a minute there. You know, when we look at some of the things that that the Egyptians have built, things that are inside the Great Pyramid that our engineers are still scratching their heads over, you know, some of the things that we have found in South America, you know, uh, that 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 we are that with all of the technology and equipment at our disposable at our disposal, we could not figure it out. And some people say, well, that means that there were aliens or that means that there was something else, uh, you know, some other yeah, magical I mean, I, intervention. I don't buy into the whole ancient alien. It's not that I don't. <laughs> let, let me let me say this. Is it possible aliens have come here? Yes, we've talked about sure. this before. However, sure. if you're flying here from a different galaxy or a different dimension or universe or whatever the case may be, you're telling me you're going to build some crude stone. <laughs> and, and they're amazing for Earth if you created them on Earth right? at that time with the tools you had, the technology you had, all that. If you're talking about something that has the ability to fly here or come here or whatever the case may be, they're going to take the time to take these huge heavy blocks, not even precisely cut them, that kind of a thing. I have a problem with that. That So that's that's yep. my problem. And it, it's again, it's not that I, I think it's possible that we could have been visited or, you know, it's even possible that we are some sort of weird consciousness light form that we don't even know how maybe consciousness was created by some other entity that we don't know about in the universe. Who knows? 
but I'm open to those ideas. However, when it comes to the specific thing that aliens built this or aliens built that, I just have, I find it just because they can't explain it. You know, what's yeah. the, the God of the gaps argument that if you don't know how, exactly. you don't know how to explain it, that it means that this is the case. So I like, and I will also keep saying this. I like ancient aliens. I think they bring attention to megalithic structures that people don't talk about. So when you watch some of those shows, they show a lot of cool stuff. They have, some cool people on like Ram Hancock and all that kind of stuff. The problem I have with it is when they start theorizing that aliens built this and aliens built that and aliens did this. And I get that that's the point of the show, but yeah, I, careful I agree. what shows you make yeah, fun it's, of. It's my just friend. an entertaining show. In my opinion. <laughs> I'm not going to believe every word that they say, or, you know, I'd say, I'd say 10% of it or 20% of it's really good information. And then, or speculation, and then the rest is take it <laughs> with what a channel, grain of salt. What channel is that show on? Well, that's history. Now, you're, now you've pissed Whoa. off. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're cool. Uh, okay, they're cool. Uh, well, I totally agree. I totally agree with what you're saying, and I would add that in my in my my theory. Again, I don't know. I was I was I have no memory. Uh, if I did have a past life uh, from back then, I have no idea uh, what what those people were thinking. But that's the point. I would say that we have. We, we have no appreciation, again, for how much our own narrative restricts us and it restricts our thinking. And therefore, we, have, we don't even have the context on any level to understand what stories people were telling themselves 5,000 years ago. We have no context for it whatsoever. Those people were living in a world that I honestly think that we can't really even imagine. We can, we think we can because we see the stone tools, we see the, the the relics that they left behind, and we can imagine someone hammering something out. We can imagine someone carving something into a wall, right? So we, but so we think that we can somehow connect the, to those people. And what I say is that we have no idea where those people were coming from. We have no idea what was going on in those artists' minds or those engineers' minds. And so I would say that because of that, they were able to create things that we are still scratching our heads over because we're just coming from two totally different, not just culture, we're coming from two different storylines. And it all comes back to that again and again. It comes back to the stories that we have been born into and I, I don't think you need to I, I agree I don't think we need aliens I don't think we need supernatural intervention to explain any of this I think we just have to appreciate just how different those people were that they weren't even thinking on the same levels of us they came up with solutions clearly they came up with solutions for things in their world that we that we have no idea we we don't get it we just don't get it you know and maybe we will down the down the road we'll have an idea but we're just we're just too different where they might as well have been aliens i suppose i think it's yeah. far more likely that a lot of these things are psychedelic uh inspiration like or they're inspired by psychedelics or something along those lines in the sense that what do you see under deep in uh, intense psychedelic trips you see geometric shapes patterns different yes. things and if you look at the pyramid it's a triangle it's one of the most base um shapes you, you Shape, yeah. yeah and and or whatever the case may be people that have intense dmt trips people that have intense psilocybin trips people that have intense lsd trips see these patterns see these images see these things so maybe somebody or a few people or a bunch of people were seeing these shapes or geometry sacred geometry whatever you want to call it and then going out and trying to, to build maybe they thought felt like that was god's giving me this message or right the entities or whatever the case may be is giving me this message that this is what i should be doing so i think it's far more likely even if you look at like the ancient greeks and the mystery schools and the eleusinian mysteries and that kind of stuff pythagoras participated in the Eleusinian mysteries this guy comes up with the Pythagorean theorem uh, yes and we know that the um Kikion, the the drink that they drink was most likely psychedelic they think oh really claviceps perpea which would be the ergot so they were it's a pre go. precursor to lsd so I, my point is is that i'm not saying psychedelics are but i think it's that's a far right. more likely theory in the sense that 
those are real things that people experience in those states that can be taken back into this reality. Maybe they're trying to recreate this other world in this reality. That would be my theory on that. I love it. I love it. I, uh, now you're getting, you're getting more into the topics of, uh, my, my first book tripping the field. That's yeah, what, I, that's what we get, that's what it that. gets into. Yeah. So sure. Uh, but let me, let me re- address what, what you were talking about first, the idea of psychedelics. Well, and I, and this, this is what, uh, tripping the field is, is, uh, is about, um, that the idea that when you talk about ancient man and psychedelics, now now you're adding in you're you're adding in not just the idea that, like I said, that they had a completely different culture, they had a completely different storyline than we did. Now you're talking about cultures that were free to use psychedelics without you know any of the uh, the ambitions we had, without any of the the dogma that we had around uh, psychedelics. Although that is ch- that's changing now, thanks to uh, a lot of you know a lot of brilliant minds that, that are really speaking speaking out about psychedelics thank god we needed that we needed more people you know who were not demonizing these any longer like they did for uh for years and years and years uh psychedelics for all for as as much as far as we know psychedelics were they had to have been absolutely the mushroom specifically the the hallucinogenic mushroom was most certainly the first drug that humans ever took because the mushroom is the one drug on the planet that requires nothing. It requires no preparation whatsoever. And that is the key to the first – if we're looking for the first drug, it wouldn't be alcohol. Alcohol requires – you know, you have, to, you have to ferment. You have right. to – you need a system to ferment, okay? Uh, you know, marijuana, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of things that out there. Now, it, it could have been something else like peyote. Possibly, uh, but we're looking when we talk about the first drug. Even that's that's subjected to just that small, tiny region and south, right, south, exactly. or um, south United States, north Mexico area. I think we know mushrooms. We know that mushrooms. Uh, well, you know, they sprouted off of cow manure just as well thousands of years ago on the African plains, just as just as they do today. There's no reason to think that those spores were, have not been around for thousands and thousands of years. So it is very likely that we had access to, you know, mushrooms. And, you know, again, those are, when, when you talk about bovine droppings, cow manure, whatever, you know, they, they grow very well on that. All you have to do is pick it and eat it. The toxicity is so low that it reliably will produce you know, a, a hallucinogenic trip at that point. So, uh, what what ancient man would have thought of that? I, I would say that that we may be looking at the birth of religion. Uh, I know that sounds perhaps like hyperbole, but I think that that's you know. Uh... I mean, that's what t- Terrence <laughs> yeah, McKenna. Yeah, there's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah Terrence McKenna's food of the foods of the uh, food of the gods. And Absolutely. Even what I was just mentioning with you know, our Gordon Wasson did a lot of writing on these topics with Soma and what we were just talking about with the Eleusinian mysteries and that kind of stuff. So there are people that research this stuff that are credible academics. So I I don't think it's that crazy now to say that the mushroom is solely responsible for the evolution of consciousness or something. I think that's where it starts to lose its steam or whatever, but having that inspiration, why not there? and, And anybody that's had a psychedelic experience can identify with what you're saying in the sense that, it's a religious or spiritual experience. You are, there's no way besides meditation or like what we're talking about, lucid dreaming. I don't really think in, there's a way to induce that, that mindset. And to take that even further, I think psychedelics are even more important in the sense that you're able to take them and walk around and interact with this reality, which you are not, really doing in meditation you have to focus and be still and calm your mind lucid dreaming you are asleep so there's no real you're maybe getting out of your consciousness or or not out of your consciousness but out of your um your normal state and and doing something within a dream psychedelics you are living the dream you are actually participating in this alternate reality for most people it depends on how much you take and what you're taking but for the most part you are walking around interacting with this thing which i think makes it completely different than a lot of the other things that we're discussing absolutely uh and i totally agree uh ex- 
except about the part of lo- where lucid dreaming. See, I've done a lot of psychedelics. Uh, I've done just about every every uh, molecule on the planet at this point. My man. And you're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a few things I've not done, but I've uh, but they they come down to analogs, really. Like, okay, I've not done that analog of that particular psychedelic, but I've done essentially every psychedelic that that I could that I could get my hands on. Uh, that the the basic, you know, that as far as the essential, diff- there's only so many different alkaloids that we know have a psychedelic effect on us, and I've on some level I've tried them all, and when I, it's still no comparison to what I would call where lucid dreaming moves into astral projection, which we talked, we talked about in our last show. Once that moves into astral projection, now you're talking about something that is just as, if not more intense than the most insane psychedelic trip, because you're, you're kind of doing the same thing. Now I would say when I say the most insane psychedelic trip at this point, I would say we're talking about either high levels of LSD or a DMT, you know, a proper DMT trip where you have, you've taken those three hits and you have, as they say, broken through. And, uh, Mm -hmm. if, if you can keep your wits about you and you can still say that you, uh, believe all of the storylines that have been in your head after a DMT trip, well then, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what you need to break your head open at that point, but that's, that's, uh, that's, that's some powerful stuff there. But, yeah, uh, th- I think they're all touching on the same thing. I think that these are these are things that uh, you know the psychedelics or lucid dreaming or meditation. They are they're removing you from your storyline. That's what I'm going to keep coming back to. They remove you from that, and when you can remove yourself from that, we can do amazing things. Like I said, uh, astral projection was something I had to learn about. I had to learn the connection that there was a connection between lucidity and leaving your body. I did not have access to the internet when this stuff started happening to me. So I had to, I had to figure that out on my own. And so I had to do a lot of question and answer when I would, I would go into these dream states and I would start finding friends and family and whatnot. I would be able to see what they were doing in some cases, hundreds of miles away. You know, I would have to kind of come back and go, wait a minute. Was I actually Seeing that person, and you know, like like we've discussed, then I would get on the phone and go, yeah. okay, okay, guys, you need to tell me what you were doing at this exact time of the morning while I was asleep. And uh, like I said, as that information kept compiling again and again, it was inappropriate for me to call it coincidence. I and mean, after a while, I just go, it's not even reasonable to say that all of this is possible coincidence, that what I experience and what I visualized is exactly what that person was doing. Uh, you know, after a while, I've got to say, all right, well, clearly our consciousness is not bound to the body. And, uh, you know, the more I got into that, then I started getting into specific techniques of getting out of the body. And there's all sorts of strange, strange things that you can do when, uh, <laughs> when you do that, there's, you can actually feel, you can actually feel yourself slipping out of your body at, at, at certain times. It's the strangest thing ever. And all I can say is that I'm not interested in, uh, I'm never interested in trying to get someone to believe me. I'm not trying to convince anyone. I'm not interested in people who just blindly believe anything. Again, I'm essentially an atheist. I have no interest in believers. I want experiencers. I want people to get into these practices and you, you want to see it for yourself. And going back full circle to my book that you had asked me about, reading about these things, one of the things that I get back from my reviewers from Tripping the Field is that they're like, I've never read anything quite like this. It's almost like this, it's like I read it and I almost feel a little bit psychotic. I almost feel like I'm losing my damn mind the more that I read this because (laughs) the book was designed, I designed the book not, not consciously a lot of that book would almost feel it was downloaded to me i don't know where some of that came from it came it that book came to me when i was quiet Mm. you know it's not like something i wrote out notes for and go you know what would work really nice here is if i added it, it the book did not come to me like this it would come to me when i wasn't thinking at all and it would just show up i don't know what that means it's like it was just out there in the ether and it started being downloaded to me in pieces so that book took years to write and Part of the intention behind it was to was that if you read the book, when the more that you read it, the book 
starts teaching you its own rules. Like it starts teaching you the rules that the storyline operates from. Okay. And so you have to kind of get into the mindset of, of the way the story works, if so to speak. And the more you get into that mindset, I think that helps. I think that all of these things that we've been talking about, having this conversation helps reading books like that I've been talking about, it helps listening to podcasts, all of that helps because your mind, I found that the more that I consumed this kind of information, the more my head was in that space. So when I would go into a dream state, you kind of have that, you know, kind of churning in your background. And so you start doing things like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can, I should look at my hand. That guy told me I should stare at my hand and it'll start happening. And, uh, that's when the fun begins, you know, and you co- then that's when I want people to come to me. You tell me what you're experiencing. You know, let's let's see if someone has a different conclusion. That I, I mean, these are the conclusions that I've come up with after some 30 years of experiencing uh, all of these crazy states of consciousness. And you know, it seems to make you, sense so far. <laughs> do you take any uh, like special vitamins or minerals or anything before you go to bed? Melatonin no. or any of that? No, I've I've heard about you know everyone's got their little trick and i think part of that is that's part of the society we live in right we want to take something we want to we want to ingest something and just <laughs> make it work oh, yeah right? you know we do we do and we're we're that kind of society and all i can tell you is that you know, i i i hear so many i i talk to so many people online who are going well you need to be a vegan and you need to do this kind of meditation and then you need to do a high colonic once a week and then you can lucid dream and maybe I, that's I, just what works for them but we're all right. obviously different people absolutely and and if it works for you my god keep doing it absolutely but it's my problem is that when it turns into the dogma when it turns into a storyline that you're Mm -hmm. trying to sell somebody else my my thing is that the whole magic about this is getting rid of the storyline is being able to work beyond the storyline so i'm i'm so frustrated with people who go well now this is the 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 astral realm and this is how you get to the astral realm and this and these are the akash ever heard people talk about the akashic records yeah yeah and i could go into that about what my my theory is on that but but they start they start creating another dogma around it and they start closing their world in again so i think it's possible if you believe in anything metaphysical i will say this that look at what what the internet is a modern day akashic record so if we have a record of this we have a record of this physical world. How could there not be some record or something tra- trapped in the metaphysical space that you could tap into? I, I don't see a problem with that. Now, Absolutely. you're talking about people like walking through a metaphysical library or something. I don't think right. that that's the case. But if you're yeah. saying that you're meditating yeah. or you're lucid dreaming or you're in psychedelic states and you're receiving images or phrasing or messages and it's got some sort of synchronicity effect or something along uh-huh. those lines. I believe in that. I don't think that there's anything. Um, we don't know enough to say that that's not the case, I guess is my point, but absolutely. Uh, but back to your point about you want experiencers and, and not believers. Yes. Isn't there something important or something powerful about believing though? And I don't mean blind, like you said, blindly, like I'm not talking about like, Oh, I believe this. And I believe the Bible word for word, even though I've only read it once and I, I didn't look into who wrote it or right? something like that. But I'm talking about somebody like you, you believe that there's something metaphysical going on that we just can't explain. Now, is it woo woo? Probably not to you, right. but there's something going on there, but you believe it. Correct. <laughs> I believe it because I've experienced it. Right. That's, that is the whole difference. But there's a lot of people that, there's a lot of people that experience weird things. I've had weird things happen where I'm not a religious person, but I've prayed and I've talked about it on on our synchronicity episode where I was, I was praying to Jesus and my, I was going through a tough time. My mom had breast cancer at the time, which she's been cleared now. So hopefully that stays the case, but, and I'm driving down the street praying and I haven't prayed in years. It's been a long time. I'm not a, religion i went to catholic school when i was younger but i'm not a religious person by all i'm more spiritual i guess if you were to sure put a a name on it and i was praying and all of a sudden i'm praying to my deceased grandfather her father praying to jesus praying to god and i'm not joking you while i'm doing that there's an old man that turns the corner with a sign on his bike that says jesus loves you on a corner that i've passed millions of times never seen this guy before never seen him again gave me the chills um 
I don't believe in coincidences like that. I know some people do or whatever you want to call it, but I think that, and I'm not saying that that was Jesus or anything like that. I'm just merely right. saying that maybe the universe is giving you some sort of sign or signal. This is what's supposed to happen or we hear you or whatever the case may be. Absolutely. I, and I, and I, I love those experiences, even when they do tap into something that has a religious icon in it. I, myself, I, over the years, I mean, I've tried everything. I, I've, I've prayed to God. I've prayed to Jesus. I've tried to, in meditations, tap into what, you know, at, at the deepest part of my soul, what does Jesus mean? And what does it mean to me? So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, throwing garbage at those ideas what i'm saying is after an experience like what you had where you were you were praying to god and you saw this saw this person that was an amazing experience right all i'm suggesting oh, is i got the goosebumps and i was like what? right what just and because when you're not expecting something like that and it happens in that moment where you hadn't done something in years and then all of a sudden you do it and you've gotten probably the crazy I, that, I would say that's probably the most crazy thing that's happened to me in that kind of a regard right uh, or scenario that's, so all i would say is my only advice is is and it sounds like you've already done it is to be very careful with the story you wrap around that experience now that experience was what it was those things happened you know and you had that feeling those were all very real things to you and so that meant something to you that is the most important part of that experience. I think the problem is, is that when the mind wants to then categorize it, it wants to put it into a box again. It goes, well, that that was crazy. That wasn't a crazy thing. Now I want to wrap a story around it. And I want to put it back into a box. That's the worst thing that you can do. Because if you think about the experience you had, if you tell that story to several different types of different religious personalities, they're all going to they're all going to tell you their own version of their story. A right. Christian, for a Christian, for example, would say, "See, that proves that the Bible is, <laughs> it proves that the Bible is correct." So now you you're a Christian now, and so you should you should buy everything that the Bible is telling you. But clearly, better call Joel Olstein. Exactly. What, what, what it proved right. to me, I'll say what personally what it proved to me is that there's more. Not to sound like Transformers, but there's more than meets the eye. You know, wow. there, there's. There's more <laughs> there's more going on than we can acknowledge or or, or understand, if you will. Awesome. Um, yeah. And, and and that's what I've taken away from it. I, I again I'm not I still don't go to church even though that happened to me and I don't I think when you look at a lot of these things, a lot of these structures and um things have been contaminated with yeah different things and beliefs and scandals and whatever but for the most part what i would say is that like i said it's something greater happened that was beyond my understanding and i don't believe in coincidence because i've had other things happen like that maybe not as compelling but other similar things to that um and, and a lot of people probably have them, but like you were saying, they probably chalk it up as, but it, it, you know, part of that storyline. Back to your point, though, about these, it's it's the narrative that you tell yourself. Now, I, I think when you're talking about, like, a let's say Jesus, some people believe Jesus wasn't a real person. Some believe people he was the, the son of God. Some people believe he was a mushroom. Some people believe all sorts of <laughs> different things. But I will say this. If you just take that archetype, of who he was, that's what we we all strive to be, right? Somebody that's compassionate, right. somebody that's caring, right. somebody that right. wants to help humanity, push them along, somebody that's enlightened. I mean, those are all the qualities that you would want to embody within this reality. So I don't think when people talk about that, even religion, I think it's how they talk about it because it can be toxic. You can say, I believe this and it says this, therefore I ban you, I shun you, whatever, you're a terrible person. Right. Those right. are the things that are toxic. I think... But if you look at the good aspects of it, you can take those and take have takeaways from it that you can implement into your own life and have positive results. I have no doubt about that. So you're right. I think it is the narrative that you tell yourself, the narrative that you tell people around you, that kind of a thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that ironically enough, if Jesus was a real person, I'd, I'd say that he would probably be in 100% in agreement with you. He would, he would say... Good, you got it. You got the message. You got the message that 
that was was you know the universe was trying to give to you at that point you know on whatever that means you know uh universal consciousness whatever you know you took a message and you and it changed you and it you know it it affected you and you didn't immediately turn it into you know you didn't put it into a box you didn't turn it into some you know limited storyline with a religion or a philosophy wrapped around it i think you handled it in that's the way i wish everyone would ha- would handle all of the crazy ex- their crazy experiences uh and uh, unfortunately, you know, religions do it. Even atheists do it. Heck, a- and that's why I always say there's an asterisk at the end of that when I say it, I call myself an atheist. I simply, by that, I simply mean that I don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in something beyond the natural world. The natural world is weird enough. The natural world is is more than our brains can comprehend. Quantum physics has already proven this: that that the world operates in ways that we cannot logically follow so we don't need the supernatural uh, we need to understand what's already there that what's already there in front of us so that's why i'm constantly saying yeah as long as you just accept those experiences at face value and just you know try to you know what what was the lesson there you know and maybe there wasn't lesson maybe there was only a feeling that you were left with right. i talked to i've talked to people who said who who told me crazy stories of things that have happened to them things that you know i i'm not sure I, I believe, you know, some of them are pretty far out, but the thing is that it happened to them and it affected them. And in many ways it affected them in a positive way. And that's what I think people need to, you know, remember, like, Hey, if you've had some weird experience, think about that, that maybe it's, maybe it has affected you. Mm -hmm. It's already done its job. You didn't have to go and turn it into a story. You didn't have to go and try to figure out, well, how does this fit into something? Like I've said, I've, I've seen, I saw a UFO about, nine years ago, somewhere around there now. And what I saw absolutely defied the laws of physics. That affected me because I'm a guy who, I like my laws of physics. I've I've studied quantum mechanics. I've studied uh, classical Newtonian physics. I, I basically, I have, an, I have a layman's understanding of how things operate, how things move. I understand propulsion. I understand force. I understand momentum. And this thing did not follow any of those rules. But I would say that I didn't wrap a story around that and go, you know, I think that those guys were from the, you know, from the the Pleiade system. And I think that they were here to enlighten my seventh chakra right. because I am the next manifestation of, I mean, people will do that. And I talk to people all day long online who have done that and they go, yeah, I'm with you. I'm, you know, lucid dreaming and astral projection. I'm like, no, you're not, we're not on the same page at all. You're not listening well, to my, but, you're not listening to what I'm telling you. But <laughs> you what know? you're saying, I mean, I agree with, and I've studied quantum physics and we've done episodes on quantum physics, quantum mechanics, right. that kind of stuff. The problem I have with that is we know that it's going to be wrong. Cause if you believe Newtonian physics, Newtonian physics is for the most part wrong. It's idea of gravity is wrong. You know, his idea was that a bird was lighter than right. you know the matter and, and therefore would would float in the air and we know now that it's pushing right. force behind it and moving you know i mean the basic math behind newtonian physics i'm saying what got us to the moon but i'm what, saying like in terms of ph- you know, that's ph- all. philosophy like thomas kuhn okay the, the 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 philosophy of science and the fact that at some point there's going to be enough evidence bottling up that will create some sort of paradigm shift and ultimately a scientific revolution so what was revolutionary let's say ancient greeks 500 bc with thales and he thought the basis of everything was water which makes sense back then we need water to live water's everywhere maybe it's the building blocks life we know that's wrong now but i'm just saying making the point that what's true today is not going to be true tomorrow based on all the evidence and to I right. think it's naive for modern science to not look at that at least and say, well, a lot, you get a lot of certainty and a lot of assurances from them, but you don't ever hear this is going to be wrong and it will be replaced in the future. This is just our best understanding of it at this current moment. And I wish Absolutely. that I yes. wish we got more of that than we know this to be 100 percent true. And we're at a pinnacle point where there's no way it can't be true in the future. That kind of a thing. I have a problem with that kind of thinking because it's sh- been shown I to be too. false. I do too. I, I think that there's so many people who even, even people who, you know, call themselves, you know, the scientists and whatnot. And I, I love my science. I love it. You know, it's a wonderful way to look at the world. It's a great tool, but that's really all that 
science is. I mean, I think when so many people when so many people think of science, they they picture literally they picture people in white lab coats with beakers in a laboratory. You know, like that's science, right? right. Science is simply a way of, you know, of trial and error, and you're figuring out what works. And when you come up with something that works, can you repeat? The same thing. Can you yeah, figure observations out observations and measurements? Observations, and we've been doing that be- be- since before we were born. We were doing that in the warm, in the womb. Does this work? You know. And then as kids, you watch kids. Kids are children. Are scientists? Mm-hmm. Little toddlers are sitting there. That is all that they're doing all day long. Is they are taking in information and they're testing and they're observing and they're going. Did that work? Well, that didn't work the way I wanted it to. Let me try this. Let me try this. That's that's all science is. So when people crap on science i'm like you don't understand science but then i also like you're saying i also get pissed off at those people who are it is they become so close yeah they become closed minded they have books and they have interviews and they have movies and they've got to defend their position and that's i think we've had that's their story my friend we've had we've we've had brian keating on who wrote the book losing the nobel prize and he does a great job of explaining how competitive it is and how much yeah yeah there is this like political thing going on as well within the, the the scientific community and this guy's trying to squash this guy's ideas and this guy hates this guy and he's trying to get rid of his ideas and it's this back and forth thing that it seems yeah. productive maybe it is part of the evolution of ideas maybe it's not sometimes uh, it seems non-productive yeah my, it does my, i guess my point is this is that since we've done this show i used to believe in a lot more than i do now however I believe oh. I believe there is this true fringe out there, and I've mentioned this before, where there is this gap where we don't know, like you said, UFOs, you had an experience, people that experience right. ghosts, people that have near-death experiences, people that talk to these aliens and entities on DMT trips, people that um, whatever you want to say metaphysical thing has happened to them that have experienced something of an alternate nature that know that there's nothing that they can do on their day-to-day consciousness to explain what happened to them. So I I believe that there is this fringe out there. Now, I think it's a lot smaller of or narrower of a gap than I once did when we first started, but I still believe even now that it exists and it's, it's walking this tightrope. It's what we've been doing this whole conversation. It's saying we understand science, which we do, and we, we love talking about it. It's understanding that people have these experiences, which are true. They, how can they not be? Some, some of these people, you know, there's liars out there, but for the most part, I feel like a lot of the people we've interviewed and a lot of the books I've read are genuine people that have had genuine real experiences that are tangible, that they can take things away from. So I, I think it's it's walking that tightrope between that and then also the crazier stuff. So the crazier right. stuff being, you know, that aliens whatever whatever, whatever your storyline is whatever storyline right yeah. yeah and we're not <laughs> even certain that with ufos which we know that there's videos of and who yep. it could be advanced technology it could be, exactly it could be an autonomous vehicle uh, people uh, there's a th- thing called the von neumann probe theory which is that you create these probes that go out in space and they self-replicate to the point where they're self-replicating all over space and pretty soon you've got all these probes all over the entire universe t- scouring it looking for nice. station whatever so cool <laughs> yeah so yeah look into that it's pretty interesting so but, right. my, but i guess my point is this is is that there is these crazy things that happen that we can't explain maybe we will in the future with science but when we do there will be a new set of problems a new set of questions maybe sure. that maybe this is driving our evolution maybe this is the thing that keeps us going keeps us pushing maybe there is some end point i don't know but you know, there's certain people that would disagree, like your Richard Dawkins and those kind of people that think that there's no point to anything and it's just what it is and that sort of thing. Which I yeah, he's got he, Richard Dawkins. I, I've read lots of Richard Dawkins. I, I like him and and Sam Harris. And there's you know, it's funny because logically there's nothing that I can really argue about with those guys. I mean, on a, I would never go into a debate for example, with Richard Dawkins, that that guy would, you know, there's no, I think we would mostly be in agreement with everything the guy said, except for he does make a lot, he, he, he's coming with his narrative as well. He's got his own storyline. Sure. He has this idea about, you know, what consciousness is also, you know, the, some of those guys are, they are, 
committed to the storyline that consciousness is created in the brain and it dies when the body does. And I'm sorry, but you just don't have that information. And I, all I can say is I personally, I have different information and I'm trying to, as much as I can get other people to experience the same kind of stuff so that everyone else, I don't want it to just be a theory. I don't want it to just be a belief. I want as many people out there as possible to go. Now I know for a fact that consciousness can do X, Y, and Z. It can, it can leave the body. It can do amazing, incredible things. It may even be able to travel to different dimensions, whatever that means. Again, right. that we all, we have another storyline about that too. The critique of the, a lot of those people that, that you are talking about is that they don't do a lot of their own experiments. They rely on information done by other scientists and then they put together sort of like a bigger picture type thing. If that makes sense. I don't know that they're doing all too much of their own research in that regard. I'm not saying that they haven't, but just when it pertains to these theories and stuff. And the other thing is the thing I disagree with, with with Richard Dawkins is that evolution has no purpose. Well, I think that's a contradiction because I think the whole point of evolution is to push towards something for whatever reason, there's some purpose. Maybe it's beyond our knowledge. Maybe we've already figured it out and we're just not putting our finger on it. Whatever the case may be, we're evolving for some reason that we can't understand. To, to, so to say that that serves no purpose doesn't make any sense because that's exactly what's happening. I don't know. I just find that a kind of a contradiction of the way things are explained, but maybe it's my misunderstanding of it too. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I do know that I, I'm not sure where evolution is heading. I, I could not, I could not say that. I think that, uh, uh, all we can do is look at the trends like you were talking about. We, you know, we can see where humanity is going and we can, we're starting to get a little bit of a picture of like, what are the, what are the bigger possibilities here? Like we're talking about the idea of singularities and could we possibly be living inside, you know, computer realities. And then that, you know, if, if that is a possibility in the future, what is, what does that mean exactly mm-hmm. for us? What, you know, what, what is reality at that point? You know, it, again, I go back to that, the thing that Morpheus says in the matrix, he says, well, if, if you're, if what you call real is just stimuli, that's, that's being transferred through your senses well that's all electronic essentially and right. we we can code for that you know and so and we're getting to the point where we can code for that and uh, so that's going to really bring up more and more questions of like well what is physical reality what is it what are the rules but going back to your science problem i mean you mentioned uh uh graham uh graham hancock uh who i i had communicated with briefly he was doing a speak uh speaking tour out here in boulder for his for his earlier uh, his latest book yeah and uh uh, he and I had a good discussion about, you know, he had a, he had an out-of-body experience himself at about the same age that I did. He was about 19, and he had an out-of-body experience when right. he he was, I think he was electrocuted or something, or he he yeah. hit some electrical. Yeah, I remember that story, and and I was and I what well, I was trying to tap him about did he think that was an inciting event for him to really make him you know, to, the first thing that allowed him to really look outside the box and to put him on this journey. And right. I, I found it fascinating that he had not really considered this. I was like, really? You haven't, you haven't thought about that? <laughs> like, I, I've heard him talk about the, it actually on London, yeah, R- London Real, um, exactly, yeah. where he talks about how the first experience, he had two near death experiences. One was when you're mentioning when he was younger and right. he felt like it did have some sort of inspirational or after effect on the way he saw things or experienced things and then the the later one he just had recent i think he had i don't know if he had like a seizure something he he had a seizure of something where he hit his head and he was like unconscious and he had to go to the hospital that's why you weren't seeing him on things for a while and i know that you know right uh he had some issues so i'm glad he's healthy now that's awesome i'm a big fan of his his books i think they're super creative and outside the box kind of thinking provoking yeah it is um but it's fascinating what he says about you know the our 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 storyline that we've been sold about even just geology. I was blown away by some of this information about right. the things that people have believed about, you know, well, we don't even want to think about the way floods flooding has happened or because they don't like that idea of, of giant catastrophic floods. So we've deleted that out of our, you know, we don't even look in those realms. Like I, you know, you, you would like to think that these people have always been open-minded and taking in all the facts and letting the facts dictate the story, but you know, instead well, of the other way culture around, culture has a flood myth. I mean, I've I've looked into. I mean, there's Hamlet's right. there's Hamlet's Mill, which is a 
a good piece of literature. And I know, you know, even look into like Randall Carlson, Robert right. Schultz's work. A lot of that stuff has to do All with those guys. Yeah. So, but, uh, but when you talk about it, like there is a myth. So why is there the Epic of Gilgamesh? Why is there Noah's Ark? Why is there, you know, the South American uh, Mayan ones? Why is there the, uh, you name it there. I can, we can go through every culture and they have a flood myth from ancient times that roughly date to what we're talking about, like early right. or um, after the younger Dryas or right. somewhere around there. 12,000 some years yeah, ago. 12, yeah. 12,000, you know, yeah. even Atlantis, which would be 9,600 uh, or uh, let's say uh, 9,600 BC. I mean, that's a long right. time ago. That's 11,600 years ago. Yep. And that, that actually exactly coincides with the dating of Gobekli Tepe, which is the earliest megalithic site that we have found to this date. So, but we're drawn to that for some reason. You know what I'm saying? Like well, there's we a have, reason we for sure par- to those. We have pareidolia you know? of the brain too. I, I try and check myself on that too. So I'm, I like to make connections as well. And you have to understand that our mind is made to make these connections. Like our, our, that's how I think we've survived is making these connections, but it also can be a negative thing in terms of learning and exploring and stuff. Mo- people that don't know pareidolia is it's putting patterns together that of things that aren't necessarily like if you look in the clouds and you see snoopy well that's not really snoopy it's just your mind saying oh this cloud formation looks like snoopy so therefore that's that's kind of what the way we started this conversation in a way that's what i was essentially saying that our mind is a meaning it's a meaning making machine it is it's it's that's what it wants to do always it always wants to create meaning on some level it wants to take any discombobulated information and it wants to streamline it it wants to turn it into something that is that is non-chaotic you know and it's funny because uh we are we are it, what's funny about that is that on the below all of that we are chaos making machines we are <laughs> we are born to create entropy on some level if you think of it on that level we are entropy making machines i mean that's that's what that's what that's what humans are that's what every force of nature is it's taking we are, I mean, on the base level is what I'm talking about. On the energetic level, we are on this planet to take order and turn it into disorder. How strange that, that how ironic it is that our brains are, they almost seem addicted to finding order. Maybe that's part of what entropy is all about, that we're, you know, we have to find order in things. But for what purpose? Perhaps to turn it into to more disorder. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, but we're, we're here to spread energy, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've had uh, we've had the scientist, cosmologist um, Jude Curvin on, who wrote the um, I think it's the Cos- cosmic hologram. I don't know. I got to look up. But huh. uh, I read uh, her book, and it's fascinating. And she what she does is she reverses the 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 idea of entropy in the sense that from a data standpoint, so like you said, entropy is going from something that's ordered or singularity to disorder where she's saying that it's the opposite when it comes to information where everything is disordered and we're like what you're saying, turning it into order. We're we're giving it a semblance where, and even if you look at the way that solar systems are structured, they, they they're it's all chaotic after the big bang. And then all of a sudden everything starts to slowly get into motion and it looks like a bunch of gears and cogs out there slowly moving the wheel. So I, I, that's what she does with it. I don't know enough about all of that to say, (laughs) but I mean, she's, she's, she's got the proper academic background and she's written a book about it. So, I mean, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and I thought it was a cool idea based on what I already knew about, uh, um, stuff but yeah the, the the book was the cosmic uh hologram so people check that i out. like it i like it yeah I, d- I don't know what to think of that I'd, ha- I'd have to read that to 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 educate myself on that but uh yeah and and the idea of that of the, the, that entropy seems to be a law of the universe and we are not outside of that is uh it's kind of a strange idea to think that essentially that is what we do we we take energy and we spread it out you know we consume energy that is that is ordered and we turn it into disorder <laughs> it's just it's a weird but how it's a weird but, thing. but when you think about that from like a logic and a reason standpoint how is that the case i feel like we create order 
Ah, uh, right. Yeah. I feel like that's. Like that. I feel like that's what we're doing. Or I mean, look, lives get messy. Maybe you go off the tracks and things become disordered. Or, but I think that are we are we part of that then? This this idea of this cosmic law because we I think as human beings we fluctuate. Sometimes our lives are in order and we're creating order, and other times we're in a disarray and where our lives are in shambles and we've got to figure out a way to pick the pieces back up. I feel like it's this fluctuation that happens throughout our lives. So sometimes I, I question whether we're even really part of that or not. Right. I, you know, and I, well, I'm speaking from, from a larger cosmic standpoint and how that actually plays out. You'd have to talk to a, to a cosmologist or a physicist to get those exact answers of how the, the no, yeah, you're right. Because it seems like we do, you know, we build things, right. We take some, we, we, you know, uh, we, we build mechanical things that are very orderly, right. Mm -hmm. But we are also taking in constantly consuming energy from the sun, from the air, from our food and whatnot. And we are constantly turning, turning it into, shit basically which is a disordered which is what which is what it is i mean that is there's there's a so i so i think that generally i'd say that a physicist would probably tell you again i'm not a physicist don't you know don't ask me these oh, to, to, don't ask me to show you the math behind this guys but they would probably tell you that the the final conclusion at the end of the day at the end of your life is that you have created absolutely more disorder always than, than, than the order that you have created. You've always created more disorder. That's, that's, that's the idea, you know, anyways. Uh, and especially when we look back at the beginning of, uh, you know, when you talk about the Big Bang, what my understanding is, is that immediately after the Big Bang, the universe was in the highest order that it had ever been in and that it ever will be in, perhaps. Again, they say that there was an actual geometric distance between all of the particles in the cosmos soon after the big bang again I, I can't elaborate more on this this is what i'm you know what i've read but the idea is that from then then after that then things started you know becoming more and more slightly disordered and they're saying that at you know well, our our universe is actually expanding. That everything eventually is is going. All matter eventually down the road will be so spread out that there will not be any, you know, physicality. There will not be planets or stars or or bodies whatsoever. Is 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 one idea at least that that we're we're all eventually moving towards complete dispersal of energy. So yeah, but I, all I'm saying is I wonder what our what what we're what our part is in, in right, that. Right, right, right. I don't know. I I couldn't say. I think that my my the, my feeling is that we're not different from the rest of the mechanics of the universe. Right, is all I could say. Well, I guess my point was she pointed out that when we had our interview with her that she was saying that there's a lot of there. I don't know if you heard of him, uh, physicist Avi Loeb from Harvard. He's the one that came up with that theory about the um, interstellar object that came into our um our solar system it was the yeah, first that long, yeah, the yeah 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 a new manuma or a new anua something i yeah, forget yeah. the name of it um but yeah. she was that guy that discovered that also talks a lot about how when you look at like an aerial view of a city it almost looks like circuitry or data like some sort of circuit board working yes on, on a on a function a high functioning level which right. back to my point about the data thing that she's reversing from like a data standpoint, it's not that from a a, a, um, a cosmic body, you know, like the sun. I got you. I got you. It's, it's more of just an informational flip of of what that is, or a, a different take on it. So, I think about that a lot too. I think if you were to get a bird's eye view of, let's say, downtown Manhattan and look down, it would look like kind of what a circuit board would look like, or kind of yeah. what what uh, some sort of computer or device would look like. Absolutely. And I, I like the idea that perhaps there's a that there's another flip flip side to entropy that, that the way that information specifically is handled. I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell right. you about that. It's it that 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 is fascinating. I, that it that is definitely fascinating. But uh, I would also say that at the sum, at the end, at the end of all of it, we can create all of our structures that we want to. And all I can tell you is that eventually they're all going to dust, man. They're right. all going, they're all eventually, you know, at the end of that equation, they're all, it's all going into dust, you know, even if we don't do it ourselves, which 
they're saying is likely, even if we don't eventually, you know, well, the cosmos is going to get us. Yeah, you know? the, the, the end cosmos. all is usually the idea that I hear usually, or this is the theory that gets thrown around the most that I've heard is that everything is going to spread out so much yeah. that the energy is going to be so dispersed that there's not going to be any heat. Everything's going right. to turn into cold mass. It'll just be cold. Just right. die, die out. So, yes, but then yep. there's theories that they're the big bounce theory, which is that everything fluctuates and it's eventually going to come back. And it's almost like a, a cyclic, cyclic th- event that's going to, you know, the big bang is going to happen again. And it's just going to keep happening over and over and over and over. Um, some people believe Sean Carroll, the multiverse theory, which is that there's infinite bubbles of universes out there that every probability of everything that there is is just a different version of itself in one of these universes um so yeah. there's so many different theories that's what i'm saying about yeah, like science like to... growing up you, you go to school and you learn these things and you're like oh it's just how it is and then right so at some point when i got older i started to read more and look into these things and actually become interested in them not being forced to learn Maybe these it things. isn't how it is yes. and it's not how it is there is no one true path or one true answer it's our best ideas are being put together or assembled and you got to kind of put them together yourself and come up with your own take on what it is and um use your it, brain people even if it's <laughs> even if even if it's our best take it's still like again i mentioned earlier it's going to be wrong in the future and by wrong i don't mean we weren't onto it or onto the basic I concept I, or idea of it it's we're going to learn so much more that we're going to look like chimpanzees you know a thousand years from now or whatever Right. And when I was talking about Newtonian physics, I'm saying that that was a model that worked very well for oh, them. Yeah. Just as just as you, you know, were talking about the Greeks, even they had models that worked for them. So I yeah, feel the Ionian that, physicists. Yeah. My attitude is that it, it, it's always models. That's all we are doing. We're all we can ever do is create. Uh, you know, a best fit. We can make a best guess, and we can create a map of of what we think this the territory looks like. But of course, all I'm ever going back to is saying, "That's great. Models are great. You know, storylines are great. But the map is not the territory." And I think that is becoming very confusing to us as we become more and more immersed in symbolism. We become more and more immersed in electronics and media we are forgetting that you know the map isn't the territory that the things that we're seeing happen on screen are edited and they're not real right. you know what i'm saying i'm saying that's take that take 100%. i can i can make that claim on so many different levels it's insane and i could you know from the from the most crude to the idea of uh you know everything that you watch on television believe it or not it's all it, there, there is an intention behind all of it, and even reality television. I love that word, reality television. It's there's no reality going on. It's all highly edited. It's all highly scripted. Everything that you watch, that you're seeing online on a screen. I always that's what I say. And my I'm, my next book is called Migration, and I talk about this. I really go into this idea of narrative, and I, I always talk about how this idea that everything that takes place on a screen, it's still not the territory. It's not the actual world and and it that's confusing to people to the point where i think that we're dealing with more and more people who are confused by what is real Mm -hmm. uh they don't even go outside anymore (laughs) you know they don't leave the comfort of their you know their couch or their television or getting away from their phone or their computer because you know it doesn't matter. I, I've had roommates. I live in Colorado. I live at the. I live on the front range of the Rocky Mountains, and I have a lot of friends out here who are computer programmers. And it shocks me all the time when these guys they they are so intelligent and they are so adept at finding information on the computer and whatnot. And then I go outside with them, and I realize that they don't really know what's around the corner. Literally, like physically, they don't know what's in our neighborhood. Mm. They don't know how to get around. They don't. They literally don't know you know, like how to get into the mountains. I'm like, you guys know that there are literally giant, you know, mountains in our backyard and they're amazing. You should go out there and look at them sometime. And, you know, and it's this idea of like, yeah, well, I, you know, my screensaver is of the mountains. So what's, yeah. what's the difference? Right. I know it's, so, it sounds, it sounds laughable, but it's like, we're, I think we're seeing that more and more and it's it's again i i in my attitude it's it's that uh, people are getting confused between the map as good as our maps are it's still not 
reality. It's not the territory that we live in. So for the last little portion of this episode, let's actually talk a little bit more about uh, lucid dreaming. Um, sure. So, I mean, we kind of went on a tangent. I thought it was a pretty cool. Ta- <laughs> I thought it was a cool tangent. We just kind of went was. with it, but it's a great you never tangent. know where you're gonna get where you're gonna go. Uh, you know but that? but back to the lucid dreaming. So. All right. Let's go back. <laughs> so you, you've discussed or described how some people do it, and we mentioned some people have a schedule where you wake up every couple hours and then fall back okay. asleep and then go back into it uh, type of a thing. There's some people, you know, there's an Eastern philosophy aspect of it. A lot of people that practice Vedanta, they when they wake up, they ask themselves, am I awake? Our buddy that's been on here a few times, yeah, Chris Anderson, t- talks about that. Um, yeah, So, so th- there's all those, but... When you are talking with people about this, is there a better ways than others in your opinion, or is it kind of just whatever works best for you? Unfortunately, there it's going to be what what fits best for you. So that's why I speak in. Unfortunately, we we we're only left to speak in these very general terms when I speak about when I talk about what's at the heart of waking up in a dream. You know, when I talk about what's really at the heart of waking up in a dream is to you are disengaging from your storyline. And I know I'm I'm sounding like a broken record, but whatever, however you can do that, and it's, people can find ways to do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the reasons we are habituated to our storylines is because, as I've said, we don't question them. So many people, we don't question our reality. We don't question our storylines at all. We never second guess them. We assume that the story we're telling ourselves is correct. So this, it be, it's helpful. The best thing is to do is to, like I said, the reality check. The reality checks are great because you're at least, and, and you have to do them genuinely. The, the biggest problem with the reality checks that I've that I've mentioned the idea of just looking at your hand for a while and staring at it and asking yourself, you know, is this real? Am I awake? Am I dreaming? The biggest problem with that is that people, they like the technique, they like the idea, but then it just becomes another habit that they do. It just becomes another thing that's a part of their storyline. You know, they have an alarm go off and some people have said this like, oh, I have an alarm that goes off on my phone, like, you know, every two hours. And that's when I look at my hand, you know, and it just becomes another thing they're doing. They're not really taking it seriously. They're not really stopping and deeply going, wait a minute, am I really awake? Am I really awake? And that's because if you think about it, that's why our dreams continue the way they do. As crazy as our dreams are, 99% of the time we are never just stopping and going, wait a minute, none of this makes sense. This is crazy. It's crazy the storyline that I'm involved in right now. And we only realize it later in the context of our daily storyline that we go, oh, that storyline was crazy. The problem is we're never questioning the storyline that we're currently operating in. I'm going to say that one more time because that's the most important thing right there. We're never questioning the current storyline that we're operating from. Later when we wake up, it's easy to go, well, that was crazy. Obviously, you know, those monsters aren't real or that planet that I was on, blah, 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 or that storyline that I was following isn't real. Well, it's easy to do in retrospect from the storyline that you're creating, but you have to learn to do that in the moment. And... You know, that's when it gets back to some of the, not woo-woo, but there are a lot of, uh, the Buddhists will talk about this, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm an atheist and I have Buddhist mala beads around my neck right now because what I love about the Buddhists is that if nothing else, their essential core is be present to the moment because that's when those, that's where those questions really take effect. When you ask that question is, Am I dreaming? You have to be serious about that. Be diligent about that. And uh, I think that's the that's that's the best gateway to get into lucidity. Beyond that, fill your head with programs like this. Keep watching. Keep watching Mindscape, guys. That's what I'm saying. Keep watching shows like I'm this. Man. Yep. Keep watching. Keep watching these guys. Keep watching Mike and Maurice. Keep uh, you know. Keep reading my books and get your head filled with this because your brain is going to start you know getting used to quite you know uh, being in unstable and ha- and you have to be used to having your own story questioned. And uh, I would say that if you're the person who relishes when you find out that your storyline 
is wrong, that something is true that you never imagined was true, either you run from that. If you run from the other in the other direction from that, lucid dreaming is honestly probably not for you. That's maybe it maybe, you know, that's going to happen in another lifetime. But if if you like that idea of, you know, I'd like to experience something that seems impossible, uh, that you've got the right mindset for it. You just have to indulge. You have to really take these ideas seriously. You really have to start questioning your own stories. And I I think that's the gateway. I think that's the that's uh, that's the door to get in. Oh, it makes nice. a lot of sense. Um, when you are lucid dreaming or whatever, how did you come up with this looking at your hand idea? Or is that something you learned from somebody? Like, where does that come from? I came, So that was from a series of books that I picked up uh, soon after I started lucid dreaming because I was desperate for information. I, Again, I was 19. I'm 47 right now. This So again, this is many years ago. The internet was not around. So one of the first series of books that I came across, and I, I looked into everything. There, you know, there's, a, there's actually even a, a, a facility out in California, or there was a facility out in California called the Lucidity Institute uh, by you know, conducted by a guy named Stephen LaBerge who wrote the book, uh, you know, How to Lucid Dream or Lucid Dreaming. It's something like that. But his name was Stephen LaBerge. He has a very nuts and bolts kind of uh, book on on the mechanics. I, I looked at that, but I was also looking for something very practical. And that that technique first came to me in a series of books from uh, an author called Carlos Castaneda. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've heard of Carlos Castaneda, he, he, he was a... The storyline is that he was a an like an anthropology student back in the 70s, and he met with a shaman in Mexico, and this shaman started teaching him all of these shamanic practices that involved uh, lucidity and astral projection, and and it goes into everything, spontaneous healing and uh, shape shifting and all sorts of craziness, uh, and a lot of his a lot of people have since said that his he made it all up. Frankly, I don't care. All I know is that whoever Carlos Casanato was, this was a guy who truly had personal insight on the topics, whether he actually got it from a shaman that he met, you know, when studying for some college courses or not, I, I don't really care because the information is, you know, it doesn't really matter who, where the information came from. If it works, it works. And that was one of the things that, that, the, that his, that his shaman taught him uh was uh that was that technique stare at your hand and Mm -hmm. uh and i loved it i said my god that's such a practical thing and i started using that immediately as soon as i read that in those books and there's a lot of wisdom in his books he wrote like six or seven books uh i can't remember how many but uh he he, he's dead he passed away now uh carlos castanada died back in the i want to say the late 80s or early 90s or so but he wrote about seven books or so so that's where that particular idea came from and uh i i took it and i ran with it and i what's interesting is that i talk i've never i've not yet come across another uh lucid dream practicer who who uses that exact technique uh and it's it's kind of shocking. I, I kind of thought that this was something that most people would have come across at some point, but uh, I've never heard anybody else mention that specific technique, but there are others. There are other techniques as well, which I'm I'm hesitant to talk about because they they could be dangerous for some people. Uh, I don't know if we have time to talk about them. It's, a, it's another discussion. Maybe we'll save that for another time, but uh, there are other techniques that I've employed that... Uh, uh, I'm actually writing an article on this one technique right now, but uh, I'm writing it with a lot of caution because it could, it could possibly. I would say that if you had any tendencies towards any sort of uh, psychosis or schizophrenia, it it could possibly, it could possibly drive you a bit into unhealthy mm-hmm. frames of mind, so to speak. But uh, we, we can Who get to that. It? But <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. Uh, I don't trust people who are sane. So, you know, <laughs> hey. but, uh, maybe next time we'll talk about that. But uh, it's, it is a long story, unfortunately. But I think that's the most practical. Staring at your hand, if you can get yourself to that point, even when you 
Or, you know, even when something strange happens in your daily life, you know, you see something odd out of the ordinary, you know, like you're, you, when you saw that guy holding the sign, for example, the first thing I would have done, I would have pulled my hand up in front of my face and I would have stared at my hand for a solid five seconds, you know, and just yeah. go. Well, okay. I was driving. But yeah. <laughs> well, it's probably not a good idea. Do it anyway, bro. Yeah, <laughs> good idea. Yeah, don't do that while you're driving if you can avoid it. And he was riding a bike, just to clarify. He was riding a bike, and on the front had like a big sign that said, Jesus loves you. I've never seen that. I, I grew up, I was in town. I live in Chica- outside of Chicago now, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I was back home visiting my mom since the first time she found out about her cancer, and that was in Michigan. And that area, I had ridden my, my bike and my cars past that area probably a million times in my life. And I have never seen that guy, and I haven't seen him since. So I have so many stories about a certain part of of Michigan. Uh, I I don't. Even, that's a whole other conversation too. If you, if you remind me some other time, I would say fifty percent of my projections took place in Michigan some two hundred years ago. Wow. Uh, in in a town called Dowagic, Michigan. I know where uh, that is. Yeah, Dowagic, Michigan. Not a lot of people have heard of it. There's a there's a there's a, a series of lakes out there called Sister Lakes, and I kept showing up there. Approximately, I'd say my guess was it was about 200 years ago, and I was dealing with a a tribe of natives who apparently lived in that area. Uh, uh, many, you know, many. I think years that's where ago. the name comes from. Well, I'm sure it is. Dowagic certainly sounds like uh, yeah, it doesn't sound like your typical English sort of there's name. There's a lot but, of Indian. Yeah names yeah. in yeah, Michigan, Wisconsin. Sure. And that's a, the that's Great, a whole other story though. But the yeah, Great Lakes you region. yeah, it is. But you mentioned Michigan. I, yeah. I had to bring that up. So maybe, but again, I got a whole bunch of weird stories about that. We'll, we'll talk about that sometime perhaps. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, do you have anything else that you want to touch on? I mean, we're, we've approached about two hours here. I think we've had a, Oh my gosh, we have. We, and we could keep Time talking. Time flies I mean, when you're learning. There's no, I yeah. think the longest episode we've done was like three hours or just under. So uh, I'm good. I've got, I do have other things I've got to get to today. So uh, yeah, I think uh, this is a good, this is a good uh, place. Two hours is a, I'd say it's a good healthy time and uh yeah uh, but again i'm always open down the road to go into some weird other strange territory again later guys yeah we'll have you back on maybe we can talk about something completely different next time all right um but uh thanks for coming on check out uh, ian's book we'll have the link below the video uh check out his website he's also an artist do you sell your artwork Tripping the field, tripping the field. Yeah, his book, Tripping yeah. the Field. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the uh, Amazon link will be down below. But do you sell your art, awesome. by the way? I do. I've got an Etsy site. Uh, so uh, I've I've opened up a, a few other galleries out there. And Is, can people get at, to that through your website? You can. If you okay. go to my website, I mean, my website, it's called Iboga Moon Productions. And because I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a cartoonist, I'm an artist, I, I just I, – so I created the website so I could house – all of these things into one thing. So when you first go to the website, it just, it's a very basic search at the very front page. It gives you a list of my, of my current appearances. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll list this and I'll list, you know, any of my radio shows or, or uh, recent articles I've done. But at the very top, you can go to my books and you can, it'll connect you directly to my books. Uh, You can go to art. The next, the next tab over is art and uh, you can look at my current collection and it'll, it'll take you directly to my Etsy site where you can buy any of my stuff. And of course, all of my artwork is all inspired by my lucid dreaming and shamanic practices as well. So nice. it's uh it's all real abstract kind of trippy stuff. So uh, yeah, it's, if you're into that and you're looking for some artwork, yeah, go for it. You said you're working on a new book too. I am. I am. It's called, well, right now the working title is called Migration. Okay. Uh, and my, it's a reason it's called migration is that it's the idea that we are a society that is moving from a slowly moving from a physical landscape over to a digital one. Mm. All right. So on some level, you know, we are more and more being inundated by digital technology now. Uh, and what I do is I discuss the power of narrative within that journey like what does that mean for us as people who are spending more and more times looking at a television looking at our phones on the internet you know are the the information highway and everything all of that has become very integral to our lives and as i've been talking about narrative throughout this discussion that is impacted 
so much by where our species is heading. So that's that's the next book I'm finishing up now. It's migration, uh, and uh, it it dives into it doesn't dive into the lucid dreaming as much. Although I touch on a little bit, I'm mostly focused on what does narrative do to you personally. Where did it start? What's the history of it? Why you know how did this start? in humanity do, you know does any other are there other animals that interact with some level of narrative uh how, you know so i go into the evolution of it and where it's going so uh it's 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 been a nice. it's it's been a fun book but uh it's it's taken me also several years to write so uh hopefully uh hopefully i'll be done with that in the next month or so somewhere around there nice yeah Cool. We'll check. Look for that when that comes out. Maybe we'll have you back on to discuss that once you uh, That'd be great. get that great. out there. Um, yep. So yeah, we'll have all his links below. Check him out. You can check us out at Mike um, Patreon.com, patreoncom slash Mike and Maurice. You get exclusive content for just two dollars a month. We have some exclusive interviews and videos on there. Uh, also check out our website, Mike and Maurice Mind Escape And yeah, thanks Ian for coming on, and we'll have thanks you so back much. on. And Thank this was a so fun always. conversation. Always a pleasure, guys. Thanks so much, guys. All right. You have a nice afternoon. You too. Take care. Peace. Bye.